Good evening. I am Lillian Cerise Williams, Director of Community Engagement and Associate Professor of Africana and American Studies at the University at Buffalo. Welcome to the Eyes on the Corridor lecture series featuring University at Buffalo Professor Dr. James Holston. The moderator for this evening's program is Dr. Mariam Thaggard, Associate Professor of English at the University at Buffalo. She specializes in 19th, 20th, and 21st century African American literature and culture, gender and sexuality studies, African American modernism, photography, and visual culture, travel, and mobility studies. And she also is an expert on mystery and de de detective fiction. Her research interests include critical race theory, film and popular culture, and photography. Dr. Thaggard is the author of Images of Black Modernism, which examines the Harlem Renaissance aesthetic theories, fiction, photography, and the formation of early 20th century African-American modernism. It's my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Thaggard. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land upon which the University at Buffalo operates which is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. I am very honored to introduce my colleague, Jim Holston, who is a professor of English at SUNY Buffalo. Jim has been living in Buffalo since 1991, and he teaches literature courses in the English Renaissance. More recently, he's been teaching courses on proletarian literature, African-American literature, uh, including courses on Black Buffalo. He's the author of two books, um, one on 17th century England and America, and the other one on class struggle in the English Revolution. He is currently working on a book on the global proletarian novel, and his paper today will be on the Buffalo Barber poet and radical abolitionist, James Monroe Whitfield. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. James Holston. Thanks to Professor Williams for inviting me to speak and to Professor Thaggart for her kind introduction. 170 years ago, James Monroe Whitfield lived on Buffalo South Division Street with his wife and three sons. He cut hair on Lake Erie steamers and in his basement shop on Main Street and he was the first great poet of Buffalo. This paper is about him and some other people involved in the 1850s struggle over slavery in Buffalo and beyond. We'll be talking about a lot of other people, but I'll get around to Whitfield before you know it. Millard Fillmore, 13th president of the United States and first chancellor of the University of Buffalo, rests in Buffalo's Forest Lawn Cemetery, which he shares with Red Jacket, Rick James, Shirley Chisholm, and John C. Lord, who we'll meet later on. Every January, a group of local organizations offers birthday tributes at Fillmore's Chile graveside. The Niagara Falls Air Reserve Station, now a drone base, sends a color guard and a wreath-bearing emissary of the U.S. president. The Unitarian Universalist Church, Fillmore's own, sends a minister. UB sends a speaker and a police color guard. A bugler plays taps. Lately, Fillmore's admirers have started to squirm. They now feel obliged to address his administration's support for the Compromise of 1850, which included the Fugitive Slave Act. Though nominally anti-slavery, Fillmore's support for the act revealed what a biographer calls his stubbornness, his almost fanatical hatred of abolitionists, and his desire to prove what might be described as pro-slavery machismo. He was a unionist, which meant something much different in 1850 than it would come to mean in 1861. It meant preserving the Union by appeasing the slaveholding South, because his unionism made a fetish of European identity while struggling to preserve slavery, expand it westward, and expel free Blacks to Africa, there's no good reason not to call it white nationalism. And it bred disunionism. The masthead of William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, declared no union with slaveholders. This amazing newspaper came out every week like clockwork, four big pages for 34 years, from 1831 to 1865. 
1859, the black poet Francis Harper said, I like the character of Moses. He is the first disunionist we read of in the Jewish scriptures. He would have no union with the slave power of Egypt. She went on to write a great, I think one of the great poems of 19th century America called Moses. Uh, it's about reconstruction in addition to uh, Exodus. Fillmore's Buffalo was the center of antebellum unionism, but as the largest US border city just across the Niagara River from Canada, it was also an important terminus for the Underground Railroad. Its north central location attracted a series of anti-slavery conventions, including a massive 1860 convention for the Republican Party, which brought along with it the Republican Party's uh, armed militia of young men, uh, very rowdy, called the Wide Awakes. And they were famous for bearing torches and acting obstreperous. I mean, this is young white men with torches of the good kind. And the East Side was a home to it was home to a small but politically active black community. From 1844 to 1846, it agitated for a vote in New York State. And in October 1847, it met at the Vine Street AME to fight efforts to return a fugitive to Kentucky. In August 1851, Buffalo faced its first case under the new fugitive slave law. After black and white abolitionist crowds gathered at the trial and the jail cell of fugitive Kentuckian Daniel Davis, the judge freed him and he took off for Canada. In March 1857, Black Buffalonians met at Vine Street to discuss the case of another fugitive, William Cooper, who had betrayed his free wife, Susan, into captivity. They agreed to shun him until he bought her back. The organizing secretary for that meeting was James Monroe Whitfield who wrote America and Other Poems, one of the first volumes by a free black poet. In 1853, one traveler described him as a man of nearly pure African blood and a person of unassuming and interesting appearance. While shaving him, Whitfield asked whether or not he would like to buy a volume of his poetry, saying the object of publishing that volume was to try to get means to support him while he should devote more time to the cultivation of his mind and to writing than he was able to do now. He was largely a self-taught intellectual. He didn't have the time to keep going to school. Since the 2011 edition of Whitfield's writings, the first since 1853, Whitfield has gained long overdue recognition. In his clash with the Unionist Fillmore faction, we see two conflicting visions of law, two visions of scripture, and even two visions of the poetry of John Milton. For the Unionists, scripture blesses the slaveholding kingdom of the present founded in compromise and established law with Milton as the unifying poet of whiteness. For Whitfield, the abolitionist, scripture blesses the democracy of the future founded in the turbulent conflict between established law and a higher law, a phrase we'll be hearing a lot today, with Milton as a militant prophet of liberation. I'll be focusing on two long poems, uh, The Arch Apostate, which damns Daniel Webster as a traitor to abolition, and How Long? which attacks Buffalo's unionist reverend John C. Lord, American slavery and the forces of transatlantic political reaction. In 1820, after his Plymouth Rock oration, Daniel Webster became the hero of American abolitionists. In 1850, after his speech to the Senate supporting Henry Clay's unionist compromise, which included the Fugitive Slave Act, he became their great Satan. Webster's speech called slavery a natural and universal thing. He suggested black inferiority. He attacked abolitionists. He advocated the forceful, forcible transport of black Americans to Africa. He drew up his speech in consultation with his dear friend, Representative Alexander Stevens of Georgia, future vice president of the Confederacy. Abolitionists like Horace Mann, Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, and John Greenleaf Whittier compared Webster, the apostate, to Satan himself. In July, 1850, Zachary Taylor died. Fillmore became president and he named Webster his secretary of state and embraced the Fugitive Slave Act as Taylor had not. It passed in September. In May, 1851, Webster visited Western New York with Millard Fillmore to celebrate the New York and Erie Railroad and to press his own campaign for the presidency. At a dinner speech on the 21st, he greeted anglo buffalonians as my countrymen from the East. He even welcomed Germans and Irish, but he was less welcoming to blacks in his open air address the next day. Why you may be told by 40 conventions in Massachusetts, in Ohio, in New York or elsewhere, that if a colored man comes here, he comes as a freeman, 
That is a non sequitur. It is not so. If he is a fugitive from labor, the Constitution says he is not a freeman and that he shall be delivered up to those who are entitled to his service. He rejected those calling him an apostate from liberty, and he retracted his fervent 1820 Plymouth Rock contrast of North and South in a new anthem to white unionism. From the mouth of the St. John's to the confines of Florida, there existed in 1775, 13 colonies of English origin planted at different times and coming from different parts of England, bringing with them various habits. But they were all of English origin. The English language was theirs. Shakespeare and Milton was theirs. The common law of England was theirs and the Christian religion was theirs. And these things held them together by the force of a common character. But white Milton is a feeble ally against radical Milton, who created the great apostate angel, Satan. And book five of Paradise Lost, by bringing up Milton, he's asking for it, given that he'd been called an apostate. In book five of Paradise Lost, Archangel Raphael tells Adam and Eve that Archangel Satan rebelled only when God leveled the entire angelic hierarchy by telling them to bow down to Christ. Though Satan outwardly submits, He's a constitutional originalist who insists on keeping things as they were. He leads his legion back to North Heaven and then browbeats them into joining his rebellion against God's innovation, insisting that orders and degree uh, jar not with liberty. Now, Milton was a political radical who defended the Puritan revolutionary government and its execution of King Charles. This made his connection to Satan particularly interesting. William Blake famously said that he was of the devil's party without knowing it. I don't think that's quite true, but I think he was drawn toward and frightened by his own Satan. He responded by drawing off Satan's rebellious energies and transferring them to a fictional character, the Seraph Abdiel, who becomes Satan's Satan. In book five, Abdiel explodes with revolutionary zeal against Satan. In book six, he joins God's royal angels and debates Satan again. Satan taunts Abdiel for joining the faithful against his troops servility with freedom to contend. Abdul responds, unjustly thou depravest it with the name of servitude to serve whom God ordains. This is servitude, to serve the unwise or him who hath rebelled against his worthier. Abdul is an uppity underling who steps forth from anonymity to drag an haughty archangel into the public sphere. He's a seraphic prophet whose lonely resistance brings him a vision of Satan's future. He's history's first warrior who attacks Satan rhetorically as an apostate, then physically with the first blow of the war in heaven. He's Milton himself in his spoken defense of heaven, though alone encompassed round with foes, prefiguring Milton at the restoration. Above all, Abdiel is faithful found among the faithless, faithful only he, earning God's vindication. Servant of God, well done. That's what his name means in Hebrew, servant of God. It's the same name as Abdullah in Arabic. White abolitionists found him irresistible, and abolitionist abdules are everywhere. In November 1859, as John Brown awaited execution, a member of the Iowa legislature wrote the Liberator, let the poor, bereaved, wounded old man die in seeming ignominy. It will only so seem in the present hour. Thousands and millions would cough in his bones and will build him a monument as imperishable as brass, and in a better age will associate his name with the faithful among the faithless found to his convictions. On the day after Brown was hanged, the anti-slavery bugle reproduced a piece asking, what was the crime of John Brown? That he raised his hand against the giant crime of the nation? That he set himself forth like Abdiel, faithful among a million faithless, a champion for the truth? But black Abdiels are hard to find. For the most part, white writers praise idealist white Abdiels who give up white privilege by turning against white unionists and secessionists. That lost privilege, which extended as far as life itself, wasn't trivial, but neither was the chronic impulse to reserve heroic moral agency for whites. In the arch apostate, however, Whitfield doesn't wait for a white authority to anoint him. Rather, he turns himself into a black abdiel by publicly denouncing Daniel Webster as the new apostate Satan. The poem first appeared in Frederick Douglass' paper in January 1852, when Webster was ailing but still alive. It forms a 166-line epic simile. As Satan rose high and fell low, so too does Webster. 
He begins with the angels deposing themselves. When gathered in the courts above, before Jehovah's burning throne, archangels own his boundless love and cast their crowns of glory down. Whitfield alludes to the four and 20 elders of Revelation 4 who fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. He also alludes to Milton's loyal angels who demote themselves a second time when Christ offers to incarnate himself. To the ground with solemn adoration down they cast their crowns inwove with amaranth and gold. Now for all the gilded grandeur of these three heavens, a leveling note sounds in all of them. Whitfield continues with hymns of praise to God, evoking the egalitarian swells of choral unity pervading Milton's poetry and Whitfield's own hymns for Buffalo's black churches, including Michigan Street Baptist. He then turns to the archangel Lucifer, who's the fairest angel in heaven, right? Before he fell, of loftiest, most capacious mind, of largest views, of strongest will, a power to dazzle, foil, and blind, make evil good and good seem ill with haughty and ambitious boast, to deeds of evil ere and climb, even before he fell. Whitfield's attack on Satan combines Isaiah's on them that call evil good and good evil, and Milton's on the fallen orator angel Belial, whose tongue dropped manna and could make the worse appear the better reason to perplex and dash maturest counsels. Midway through the poem, the simile so clause of the, the simile so clause appear, appears. So in our nation's Senate hall. Whitfield takes us back to Webster's years as senator from Massachusetts when he was called the godlike most complete in all the attributes of mind. There's a great deal of intellectual respect for Whitfield, which sets uh, Webster up for his fall. Whitfield offers an appreciative review of Webster's career, singling out his famous anti-slavery address of 1820. On Plymouth Rock, his voice was heard in tones which like a clarion stirred the blood in every freeman's veins. Like Prometheus, and young Lucifer, the light bearer, this early Webster fanned the latent spark divine implanted in the human breast of sympathy with the oppressed into a bright and living blaze beneath whose fierce and scorching rays tyrants had cowed in the dust. Now this latent spark divine echoes Milton's lament for the human face divine. He was blind and laments the sight that he's lost. And Whitfield saturates this poem with Milton after reviewing Webster's anti-slavery slavery glories from 30 years before, he exclaims, but oh, how changed. This echoes Satan's startled first sight in hell of Beelzebub, but oh, how fallen, how changed. Webster lies now prostrate, now groveling in the dust, recreant to his most sacred trust. Like Milton's Satan returned to hell from Eden when God turns him into a monstrous serpent on his belly prone. Whitfield makes Webster the degenerate culmination of a series of great traitors, including Judas and Benedict Arnold, who refused to shake his hand in hell. Judas has his limits, that far he won't go. Webster lies far beneath the slaves he has betrayed. And sinking from his high estate without excuse of any kind, the lust of power or pride or hate or imbecility of mind has stooped in freedom's council halls where live the memories of the brave to be the meanest thing that crawls the earth, a voluntary slave. Beautiful final phrase, I think. Whitfield's closing lines condense Abdel's argument to Satan that true servitude chooses to serve the unwise. Milton's Abdel, however isolated, maintains optimism, solidarity, and martial discipline. Whitfield also turns outward toward prophecy and a vision of collective conflict like that which vindicates Abdiel. His Webster ascends with his Plymouth Rock oration, falls with his 7th of March speech, and departs to the strains of a premature epitaph, which leaves us a glimpse of the future. In future years, when men desire to speak, to speak in strong hyperbole and give in one small word the fire and essence of iniquity, that name shall suit their purpose well, for not mid all the fiends of hell could one be found that would express so well the depths of littleness, and Webster's name shall ever be the deepest badge of infamy. Webster is beyond saving, but not beyond damning. From the despairing paralysis of the 1850s, gouged out by the Fugitive Slave Act, Whitfield imagines a post-slavery public speaking of dead Webster with hatred and hope as they craft their free orations. Part two, Webster's How Long is his most republished poem. It combines an attack 
on the local and national members of the Fillmore faction and a tragic epic on Atlantic political reaction in 1853 with some hints of prophetic hope. Four days after Webster's infamous March 1850 speech, William Seward, Senator from New York, delivered his maiden speech in the Senate. Its most influential line declared, the constitution regulates our stewardship. The constitution devotes the domain to union, to justice, to defense, to welfare, and to liberty. But there's a higher law than the constitution, which regulates our authority over the domain and devotes it to the same noble purposes. This phrase, the higher law, is everywhere after Seward's speech. It's just, you can't, you can't get away from it. The response to Seward's speech reveals a fundamental clash between two visions of the law. On the one hand, Southern and Unionist conservatives scoffed at the idea of a higher law. Speaking in Albany in 1851, Webster mocked, the notion of private men and political bodies setting up their own whims or their own opinions above it on the idea of the higher law that exists somewhere between us and the third heaven, I knew, never knew exactly where. The next month in Virginia, he said, this higher law ranges farther than an eagle's flight above the highest peaks of the Allegheny as the code of the fanatical and factious abolitionists of the North. This fear came to a head in November 1859 at the trial of John Brown. A correspondent called his raid on Harper's Ferry an inevitable sequence of the stupendous fallacy of his higher of the higher law, which is nothing more than the law of personal feeling. On the other hand, abolitionists invoked the anti-slavery principles found in constitutional, nat natural, and divine higher law. When the higher law stumbled in Congress with the ratification of the Fugitive Slave Act, it began fermenting in society as a whole among poets novelists, philosophers, and preachers. Ralph Waldo Emerson called Webster's Albany speech wretched atheism, shocked that he believed there existed no higher law in the universe than the constitution and this paper statute, which uprooted the foundations of rectitude and denied the existence of God. At a July 1854 anti-slavery rally, Henry David Thoreau called for more men, not a policy, but a probity who recognize a higher law than the constitution or the decision of the majority. In February, 1860, a Senate committee asked former Ohio Congressman Joshua R. Giddings if he had sponsored a lecture by John Brown, who'd just been hanged, uh, and delivered lectures of his own asserting an abolitionist higher law grounded in natural law and arbitrated by the people. He cheerfully confirmed the reports. Senator Jefferson Davis and his other interrogators were alarmed when Giddings went on to compare Southern slaves' right to revolt to the US's right to butcher, his word, the Algerian captors of enslaved Americans. A little while later, Jeff skedaddled back to his plantation into Richmond and became president of the Confederacy. Fillmore's support of the Fugitive Slave Act led to widespread opposition in Buffalo. The minister of his own Unitarian Universalist Church denounced him. On October 3rd, 1850, a mass meeting of Buffalo Blacks um, recognized the Constitution as a higher law than any legislative enactment like the Fugitive Slave Act and threatened armed resistance to slave hunters. Two weeks later, a second meeting repeated that threat, vowing to test the constitutionality of this law before the United States Supreme Court and exercise the last remaining right of freemen and which no tyranny can ever wrest from us, that of dying in defense of what little liberty we possess. Whitfield sat on the organizing committees for both of these meetings. One likely reader of these stories was the Reverend John C. Lord. He was a Presbyterian minister and the leader of Buffalo's nativist Protestants who hated the newly arrived famine Irish. In 1849 to 1850, in the middle of the cholera epidemic, Lord sniffed a popish plot at Sisters Hospital, which is still with us today, founded by the abolitionist Irish American Bishop, John Tymon. He worked to defund it. Later in the 50s, he would become a know-nothing leader. Like Whitfield, he was also a Milton-loving poet and adapted Milton's sonnets to poems of praise of Buffalo's Protestant ruling class and attacks on Catholics. On October 24th, 1850, Lord entered the fray over the Fugitive Slave Act with a unionist attack on white race traitors. The disunionist is not only a traitor to his country, but to humanity itself, aiming a blow at the land of their birth and the government to which he owes allegiance, 
he is guilty of high treason against his race. Lord contrasts the English Puritans destined to conquer and evangelize Asia and kidnapped Africans, the most stupid of barbarians who would occupy the position of a menial until expelled eastward to Africa. Reverend Lord was the Carl Palladino of the 1850s, who's a little bit smarter, a little bit more racist, but they're in the same ballpark. In autumn 1850, a group of New York City businessmen organized a nationwide series of sermons friendly to the compromise, including one by Lord. On Thanksgiving Day, he preached a sermon titled The Higher Law in his Buffalo church. To defend the Fugitive Slave Act, he invoked St. Paul in Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, and the powers that be are ordained of God. He says domestic slavery in this country is older than the Constitution and must be preserved on the basis of the common ancestry of the white North and South, Saxon and Norman blood, Puritan cavalier. But no benefit can flow from a separation of the states to that unhappy race about whom this whole controversy exists. The forms of freedom are of little consequence to him who is made by color and caste, a hewer of wood and a drawer of water quoting the biblical uh, damnation of the working class. Their only hope is some rudimentary education, then expulsion to Africa. Perhaps alluding to the October resolutions of Buffalo's black citizens, he notes that appeals have been made to a higher law as justification, not merely of a neglect to aid enforcing particular statute, but of an open and forcible resistance by arms. Lord warns against those who talk of a higher law and against, quote, communists and levelers of all sorts. This moment of anti-communism surprised me at first, but I mean, he was giving the sermon in the very month that the Communist Manifesto was first translated into English. So it shines, it resonates. He attacks efforts to incite the poor against the rich. He warns against servile insurrection, slave rebellion, and he builds to a white bourgeois apocalypse. In the civil war, he says, property, both at the North and South, will immediately and decidedly depreciate in value. It's always about property values. Lord's pamphlet drew a barrage of responses from Buffalo and far beyond. It ignited a furious newspaper controversy in Buffalo. On New Year's Eve, 1850, Frederick Douglass at a speech in Buffalo denounced it. On January 13th, Millard Fillmore thanked Lord for the higher law, saying tens of thousands of copies were being printed and distributed to the abolitionists to preserve the fugitive slave law. Now the same page of the 1850 Buffalo Directory lists Lord as pastor of Central Presbyterian and Whitfield as trustee of East Presbyterian Church, but the resemblance stops there. For Lord is a temple priest who denounces immigrants, Catholics, abolitionists and blacks from his elevated pulpit, while Whitfield is a barber prophet who shouts out from his cellar shop at slaveholders and their Northern allies. He joins the fervent 1850s response to the Fugitive Slave Act, speaking directly to the higher law controversy and to Lord's pamphlet. His How Long draws its opening lines from Psalm 13 and from Reverend, Reverend Lord's handy name. How long, O oh gracious God, how long shall power lord it over right? Here and throughout his work, he attacks unionist clerics from the North more than he does slave drivers. In a furious Miltonic attack on hireling priests, he redirects Milton's hatred of state paid English clergy toward American doctors of divinity leagued with treacherous politicians. He defends abolitionists who expose their vile intrigue and vindicate the rights of man. The Muslim heathen atheist Jew, he says, stay truer to their own professions than corrupt pro-slavery Protestant ministers. Even the cunning Jesuit, he says, might learn from those who stand high in the gospel ministry, the very magnets of the land in evangelic piety, that conscience must not only bend to everything the church decrees, but it must also condescend when drunken politicians please to place their own inhuman acts above the higher law of God. And on the hunted victim's tracks, cheer the malignant fiends of blood. Whitfield links the drunken politician Webster who had died of cirrhosis the previous October, a notorious legendary drinker to fugitive slaves and to Lord's pamphlet, whose title becomes an obsession and he subtly attacks Lord himself. 
the clergy lend the awful name and sanction of the deity to help sustain the monstrous wrong and crush the weak beneath the strong. Lord, thou hast said, the tyrant's ear shall not be always closed to thee, but that thou wilt in wrath appear and set the trembling captive free. This exclamation of Lord, exclamation mark, looks backward at the cotton divine, John Lord, and forward to Jehovah who plague stiff-necked Pharaoh and those in Jeremiah who shout peace, peace, where there is no peace. Like Milton, Whitfield turns away from religious mysticism to political activism. True, at first, he seems to blame slavery for the horrific cholera epidemic of 1849, which killed 1% 1 of Buffalo's population. But he goes on to emphasize slavery's historical manifestations. The current crisis is not like the plagues which Egypt saw but an abomination visible to a self-taught intellectual who reads books and periodicals. Yet to the eye of him who reads the fate of nations past and gone and marks with care the wrongful deeds by which their power was overthrown, worse plagues than Egypt ever felt are seen wide spreading through the land. Whitfield prophesies the civil war. His vengeful God sows not cholera, but the seeds of a devouring fire that will taint the fountain springs of moral life, planting the future germs of deadly strife. Whitfield's despairing poem revises two optimistic views of transatlantic liberation from the 40s, while maintaining a broad international focus. In 1843, the National Convention of Colored Citizens in Buffalo unanimously affirmed Henry Highland Garnett's resolution that we hail with joy the progress which the people of Ireland are making in the cause of liberty. So black Irish solidarity. And Garnett's thundering address to the slaves of America called for an armed black uprising like the national liberation struggles of ancient Israel, modern Europe and Haiti. Garnett's radicalism frightened Frederick Douglass to death. He was also at the convention. He feared a retaliatory massacre but he shared Garnett's international optimism. In 1848, Douglas linked American abolition to West Indian emancipation and to the kind of epidemic European revolutions of that year. The grand conflict, he sounds like William Blake in this next prophecy. The grand conflict of the angel liberty with the monster slavery has at last come. The globe shakes with the contest. Even the arch racist Senator John Calhoun of South Carolina, Douglas says, found himself embarrassed as to how to vote on a resolution congratulating the French people on the triumph of republicanism over liberty, 1848. But two years later, the Atlantic world was all Calhoun. As European reaction crushed the revolutions of 1848, the Fugitive Slave Act crushed American hopes of political abolition. Whitfield conducts a visionary survey of the counter-revolutionary Atlantic and finds that in every region of the earth, oppression rules with iron power. Turning to Europe, he sees Danube's waters where the Magyar vainly strove against Austria. Emperor Louis Napoleon has established himself with despotic pride in France. Whitfield attacks Pope Pius IX, not as Lord's theological apostate, but as one more tyrant who turned on the Roman Revolution and wades through Roman gore with the help of Austria and France. Most striking, Whitfield bookends his survey of black backsliding Europe with black America. He places the slave trade at the origin of global conflict. Numerous tribes spread near and far, wage fierce, devastating, barbarous war to provide victims for that trade who flow out on Gambia's swelling flood and Niger's darkly rolling wave. And he concludes his historical survey of political reaction with the United States, the refuge of the brave and true, which presents worse scenes of rapine, lust and shame than ere disgrace the Russian name, worse women whippers than Austria. Whitfield spends a surprising number of lines on Hungary's struggles against Austria, probably because of the sensational 1851 to 52 American tour by exile Prince Lajos Kosovo the governor president of Hungary. The resulting Magyar mania, as one diarist called it, drew huge crowds and a brisk trade in rakish Kosovo style slouch hats, but not the financial and political aid Kosovo sought. Abolitionists responded with contempt when Webster declared solidarity and they waited in vain for Kosovo to compare Hungary's liberation struggle with black Americans. 
In a scorching attack on Kosovo's praise of the U.S. Constitution, Wendell Phillips asked, do you ever find the slightest allusion to the fact that one sixth part of the inhabitants under it are denied those personal rights which make the sufferings of the Magyar peasant tame in comparison? Kosovo loves his countrymen, but with only a local patriotism. Phillips concludes, even Webster loves the whites. On May 28, 1852, 30,000 spectators saw Kosov speak in Buffalo. That's a crowd. Whitfield recalls the day when he counts the fanes, a kind of poetry word for temples, looking toward Europe, away from the South. While all the oppressed from every land are welcomed here with open hand and fulsome praises rend the heaven for those who have the fetters riven of European tyranny and gravely struck for liberty. And while from 30,000 fanes mock prayers go up and hymns are sung, three millions drag their clanking chains, unwept, unhonored, and unsung. From 1845 to 1855, refugees from Germany and Ireland doubled Buffalo's population, while those from the South were hunted, tried, and returned. Whitfield here joins the perennial aching Black welcome to new immigrants who step off the boat and promptly start whitening themselves. Here, and in later writings for Frederick Douglass's paper, Whitfield advocated Black nationalism and a desperate migration to Central America. He even uses the phrase manifest destiny at one point. But he did not simply imitate the white nationalism of Fillmore, Webster, and Lord. Rather, he joined up black nationalism with the universal liberation. I think this is the black American default before and since, which is both nationalist and universalist. Here I think about black, black gospel Christianity from the beginning to today. David Walker's appeal of 1830, amazing, violent, brilliant, analytical oration, steep in Afrocentric history and the Declaration of Independence. Mary Talbert's Buffalo vision of Black and international liberation, which Professor Williams has already so eloquently addressed, and she's hard at work on the full-length biography of Mary Talbert, for which I cannot wait. The Black Belt Nation of Harry Haywood and the Communist Party USA in the 1930s, Malcolm X's Black Nationalism and Anti-Imperialism, the first Rainbow Coalition of Fred Hampton and the Chicago Panthers with the Puerto Rican Young Lords and the Poor White Young Patriots. So nationalism plus universalism there too. The second Rainbow Coalition of Jesse Jackson and the Combahi River Collective of our recent speaker, Barbara Smith, who defined Black women's identity politics as part of anti-colonial socialism. In a Black internationalist speech of December 1956, in the midst of the Soviet assault on the Hungarian uprising, Dr. King wryly diagnosed a relapse of American Magyar mania. I know this afternoon our minds leap the mighty Atlantic and our minds and hearts go over to Hungary and we're concerned about what's happening there. But it's strange that the government can be so much concerned about the Hungarians and have not the slightest concern about the Negroes in Mississippi and Alabama in Georgia and South Carolina. In the arch apostate, Whitfield performs Abdiel without waiting to be anointed and how long he incorporates Black America into the history of the entire Atlantic world, not as a neglected add-on, but as a vital part of the whole. He ranks and interrelates various forms of oppression, brings his survey to bear on local conditions, and prophesies a struggle that will change the bleeding present into a future where all mankind from bondage free exult in, in glorious liberty. At Buffalo's 1843 National Convention of Colored Citizens, Henry Highland Garnett tried to incite a Southern slave revolt. Ten years later, Whitfield becomes what he calls a pen of living fire, sketching the war in heaven looming on the earthly horizon. I'll wind it down now. In the early 1860s, Whitfield moved to San Francisco, where he barbered a lot, wrote a little, and became grandmaster of the local Prince Hall Masons. He died in 1871, aged only 49. Five years later, Gordon W. Burnham, a conservative New York millionaire, erected a statue of Webster in Central Park. One side of its pediment quotes Webster, liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. At its November 1876 unveiling, smack dab in the middle of the turbulent and protracted election of President Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes, 
a series of white orators remembered Webster's hatred for disunion, but they neglected his tolerance for slavery, which was being half restored even as they spoke. With the Compromise of 1877, Reconstruction became reconciliation and unionism became once again, the gentleman's agreement of Northern and Southern white capitalists to disenfranchise and exploit blacks. Hayes withdrew federal troops from the South and set them on railway strikers in the North. The Red Shirts, the White League, and Southern police departments continued to murder Black freedmen with impunity. But anti-racist struggles then and now have resisted those murders, and they've revived that classic genre of Puritan performance art, the smashing of the idols. On the evening of June 15, 2020, Black Lives Matter New York City summoned the spirits of Milton and Whitfield and visited Burnham's statue of Webster. Above the unionist slogan with hot pink spray paint, they wrote racist bitch. One activist remarked, Daniel Webster supported slavery in the South throughout his long racist bitch political career. He ensured the passage of the Compromise of 1850, which enacted a series of fugitive slave laws and allowed slavery in the new US territories after the Mexican American War. Fuck racist scum, fuck the NYPD, Black Lives Matter. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for your paper. Um, while we wait for some questions in the chat, um, I was curious about your discussion um, of Whitfield and Frederick Douglass. I was wondering if you could speak more about the sort of um, uh, disagreements, I guess you could say, these two uh, figures had. It was a prolonged disagreement in the pages of Frederick Douglass's paper in the summer of 1853. I mean, Douglass was continuing to publish Whitfield's poetry, including a very long allegorical poem called A Vision, but Whitfield was also arguing strongly with Douglass and a colleague of Douglass at the paper, I forget his name now, about the kind of perennial question of um, reforming America from within, a civil rights struggle versus emigration. Whitfield favored emigration to Central America at the time. His buddy, Martin Delaney, was still favoring emigration to Africa. And there were also proposals for emigration to Haiti. Um, I read this kind of as two different responses to the sort of the desperation that followed from the Fugitive Slave Act. What do we do now? And it ended, and Whitfield became a supporter of the Civil War once the war broke out, as Delaney did too. I was also interested in your discussion about Whitfield's movement to San Francisco. Um, could you say what sort of propelled his movement from New York to the West? Nobody knows. There are theories that he went to San Francisco to begin scouting out territories in Central America. It's not that much closer, but somewhat closer than Buffalo for Black emigration. Um, the newspapers, if you just go through newspapers.com at the time, he is all the hell over the place on the West Coast, moving from California to Northern California, to Oregon, to Idaho, to Nevada, cutting hair in some places. But I mean, there are a lot of heads to cut in San Francisco. So he went, was going to little towns throughout the West. It seems like something else was going on, that there was some kind of organizing going on here, but we don't know. We don't always have his little records of his movements. Do you know how Whitfield learned how to barber? It was in the family. His brother Joseph was a barber too. And his brother Joseph, I think was a considerably older, came out to Buffalo first. Um, there's a book on black barbers. I, yeah. haven't, I haven't read it. Um, who, is, who is the guy who was Emily Dickinson's editor? Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Thomas Wentworth Higginson has a great sentence and he says, I can quote it pretty closely. It's a wonder to me that so many white men trust their throats to the gentle ministrations of a black man with a razor, mm -hmm. right? And um, in Melville's great Benito Serino, Babo is uh, cutting, uh, is shaving his master uh, Benito Serino and mix him as a way of um, uh, warning him. Mm -hmm. um, Frederick Douglass is kind of appalled at the idea that he's a barber and other black advocates of Whitfield are too. Douglass has come out of that cellar Whitfield. I don't know why, they don't like him barbering. 
they wanted to be doing something that isn't like serving white men, maybe. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Can you speak more generally about Whitfield's presence in Buffalo and his work with the Michigan Street Church? He was a Presbyterian. And I don't know, I don't really understand Black Presbyterian in this period. My sense, Presbyterianism in the period, my sense is it's kind of upscale, less evangelical, but he was associated with the Michigan Street Baptist Church and participated in kind of civil rights abolitionist gatherings there. He wrote a great hymn to the founding of the Michigan Street Church and to the Vine Street AME. Um, as, as Professor Williams has shown, Michigan Street continued to be just a center of um, abolitionist and then civil rights organization with Mary Burnett Talbert living right next door, right? It's in our house right next door. Um, but about his church going, we don't know. He doesn't really seem all that evangelical. He seems a little bit secular to me and into Jacobinism and a more secular romantic strain of radicalism, though he certainly plugs into religion all the time. Um, the church he was part of, East Presbyterian, didn't have a building. It had a number of trustees. I think they must have met in people's homes. I, I have a question. I don't know if it came through, but I'm curious to know the impact of the Prince Hall Masons on Whitfield. I haven't seen any record of, of a lodge in Buffalo. He spoke at Prince Hall meetings in San Francisco. Let me ask you, because I'm ignorant about this. Are, are the Prince Hall Masons, are they... I mean, white Masons are particularly associated with the Presbyterian church. Are the Prince Hall Masons particularly associated with black Presbyterian churches? I don't think so, but. No, no, not at all. With all African-American churches, mm -hmm. um, make, uh, the Methodists, the Baptists, yeah. and the, uh, some Episcopalians in, in, in Buffalo as well. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the leading organizations in terms, a legacy organization, first of all, that did support reform efforts for African-Americans and formed coalitions with other groups. So I was just curious to know what role, if any, they played in his um, act activism. I think, I think he was ahead of the Prince Hall Masons in all of California. So his organiza organizational skills went out with him to California, but I don't think we have any records, or at least I don't know of any and neither does uh, the recent edition of, of Whitfield's work, know of any records of his work with, with the Masons there. He, I think he's he was buried in a Masonic cemetery. That's about as far as we go. Okay, thank you. And, and then in terms of Douglas and his seemingly opposition to Whitfield being a barber, I think it had something to do with his notion of what an intellectual was and that the community could not support this intellectual, but could indeed support a barber. In fact, being a barber in the mid 19th century was a pretty good profession for one to have. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in 1843, I think it was 1843, 53, one barber, a Johnson who worked in Albany earned something like $53,000. Oh, really? <laughs> He had three boys to feed, right? He, he was supporting his family and there were people are a little bit snooty toward his barbering. Um, I've always been astonished at how much he read given his working so hard all day long. He was just enormously well-read in journals and books in the period. Um, I would come home and drink and snooze, but he didn't, he came home and read. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one person asks, can you speak a little bit more about why so many of these arguments were happening in religious spaces? It feels like religion was a tenuous space since the same evidence can be used to argue for opposing sides, in this case, both pro and anti-slavery. It's the terrain on which people fight and the Hebrew scriptures provide both an account for divinely ordained slavery in the Davidic kingdom, and they provide an account of cities of refuge that give refuge to slaves. 
and they're right there alongside each other inside this complicated long-term assemblage of the canon of the, of the Hebrew scriptures in particular. Um, and there are arguments to be made on both sides. I mean, John C. Lord's pro-slavery pamphlet is not unskillful in its marshalling of biblical evidence in quoting that famous verse, the powers that be are ordained of God. Okay, it's absolutely there in St. Paul, 13, uh, Romans 13, and also absolutely there are the prophetic uh, denunciations of that kind of argument, the denunciations of temple priests and of courtly corruption. It's the, the ground on which you could become learned, reading from the scriptures, acquire arguments, and enter into the debate. I never get a strong sense of Whitfield as a fervent believer. I do get a strong sense of Whitfield as a fervent reader of the Bible, mm -hmm. precisely so we can enter into these debates. I don't know if that answers the question, um, but as, as I look at 19th century literature, the pro-slavery arguments, they can plug into certain biblical passages about um, Ham as the cursed son of Noah and the progenitor of Afro-Americans, but they seem much more secular. The pro-slavery arguments seem much more secular, grounded in political economy, in theories of what will happen if there's a, a collapse of the economy in the South. The, the anti-slavery arguments seem much more grounded in scripture, okay. less secular. There is another question. Um, this person would like to know more about what you described as Lord's moment of anti-communism. Would you speak a little bit more on the relationship between radical democracy and threats to property and capitalism more broadly? Yeah. Um, historians are looking more and more at the Civil War. I mean, the, the sort of classic work for this is uh, W.B. Du Bois's magnificent Black Reconstruction, which Du Bois is writing from a Marxist perspective, and he sees the beginning of the Civil War as a process of labor withdrawal. I mean, this is really the place people turn to for a Marxist reading of, uh, of, of the Civil War. I mean, I'm just beginning to read some of the, the younger historians of the Civil War. Matt Karp has written um, just brilliantly, I think, on the social revolutionary dimensions of this struggle. Um, at one point, Whitfield refers to the ruling class throughout history. There are these, for me, surprising moments of Marxist language that appear inside this debate. It's still a little bit staggering to see Lord refer to communism, but red baiting was in the air after 1848 and it made it over the Atlantic. And there is a fear of social revolution that will come with the Civil War. If Thaddeus Stevens had won his way in radical reconstruction, if the Black radicals in the South had won their way, it would have been the great social revolution that America's never seen. And what, I'm trying to place Whitfield in relation to this. There are these moments of social radicalism, but he doesn't talk that much about economy. Not finally. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question. You mentioned several nationalist movements against racial and capitalist oppression in the 19th and 20th centuries. Do you think there are some direct connections between the movements or are their movements spontaneous without direct influence? Again, Du Bois is a great sort of transitional figure here. Du Bois is looking back in Black Reconstruction at these maybe not exactly communist moments, but moments of radical small producer democracy in the South, which if they had persisted, if Rutherford B. Hayes hadn't withdrawn the troops, might have led to a social revolution. And Du Bois is looking out to the 1917 revolution in Russia uh, and backward to this. I mean, he's a key transitional figure. You know, I'm still, I, I want to talk more to Professor Williams about Mary Talbert's readings and how much she looked back at this moment and whether or not Mary Talbert was a transitional figure of this sort. Before the talk today, we were uh, talking about um, Mary Talbert's organiz organization of or membership in a group called Women of Darker Races. What was it, Professor? International 
Council of Women of, of the Darker Races. Of the Darker Races. And she's clearly looking back to the Civil War and thinking about the anti-imperial mo movements of 90s and later, right? So Du Bois and Talbert are pretty important transitional figures for this. I don't know about the Panthers reading about, I don't know if the Panthers read Du Bois on Black Reconstruction. They may have, I'm just ignorant about this. Now, I was curious about how a scholar of the English Renaissance gets interested in with the poet, an African American poet of Buffalo. So can you tell us how you came across Whitfield and what sparked your interest in his writings? I think I first read about him in Mark Goldman's still best general history of Buffalo. It's either called City on a Hill or High Hopes. He's written two histories of Buffalo in, in one or the other. Uh, Professor Williams told me that she first heard about Whitfield from a conversation with Desmond Hamlet, professor of English at the University of Buffalo, whom I never met. He was gone before my time. He was a teacher of Milton, but he had an interest in Whitfield as well. I suspect the Milton connection was there for him as well. So I guess I'm, I'm interested in revolutionary movements. I've written both of my both of my books on revolution in the um, in the 17th century, and I've been seeing. Black radicals looking back to the English Revolution um, as a kind of model for their own activity in uh, transforming America. So there's a strong resonance, particularly between the Puritans of the 17th century and uh, Black radicals in the 19th century. Du Bois compares John Brown to the Puritans. Uh, the great um, Reconstruction novelist Albion Tourget compares them as well, compares uh, Blacks under Reconstruction to uh, the radicals of the 17th century too. It's there in a, in a lot of that. So this is also one of the connections that the previous question uh, asked about um, Tourget, Du Bois and others establishing this kind of historical connection among radicals. Any other questions for our speaker? Oh, we have one other question. Um, this is from Douglas Baseford. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, I believe he had one or two sentences about circum-Atlantic solidarity, including in Ireland. I'm wondering if you might elaborate on Whitfield's use of Walter Scott's famous line from the Lay of the Last Minstrel. Do you find Whitfield saw something of a kindred spirit in Scott on the question of Scottish nationalism independence? Yeah, Edward Whitley talks about this line. Um, unsung, what is the line again? unsung, unauthored. It's the Lay of the Last Minstrel, who is a Scots minstrel alienated from his people. Whitfield quotes it at the very moment he is sort of pushing away against white America, but it's simultaneously this moment of um, solidarity with Sir Walter Scott and his celebration of the embattled Celtic peoples um, of the British Isles. So, I mean, romantic poets in the 19th century were constantly turning to conservative, reactionary Sir Walter Scott, who nonetheless had this sort of powerful, sympathetic connection to besieged and embattled peoples. And Whitfield feels that resonance, I think, with Scott in that line. Edward Whitley, in his book on uh, American epic, talks about the Scott connection uh, very nicely to Whitfield. And good call, Doug, on hearing the line. I'm impressed. <laughs> well, I think that concludes this session. Um, Dr. Williams, do you want to close us out? First of all, I just want to thank you for a phenomenal lecture and discussion. And thank you for your participation also, Miriam. I also want to remind you to tune in next week for our final session uh, when Dr. Sharon Amos will be talking about her research on Buffalo women's centenarians. And I'll look forward to seeing you at that time. Thank you again for your attendance and your support. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.